Now, away from that conversation, we'll be moving over to a top story. We're looking at politics in Nigeria. We've complained a lot of the time about the reputation and the integrity of those who hold office. Today, we're going to be looking at that and more, looking as well at the civic engagement of women in politics. Now, joining us to have this conversation is a lawyer and a politician. His name is Ilemona Onoja. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank it's you for joining us. Hi. Hey. <laughs> now, I don't know how we should go about this. I don't know if you want to start off with female civic engagement in Nigeria, or I think more importantly, we should start off touching on the notion of technocrats. Has it come to a point where we need to see more technocrats in the policy? Um, I, I can start wherever you want me to start, you know, really, but let me, maybe I should take the second one first. Um, I, have we not always been at that point? We've always been at that point. One of the things that I've never understood about Nigerian politics, and politics in quite a lot of places, is the notion that politics is a dirty game, and so the best way to, is to stay away from it. I've never been able to understand that notion, to be honest, and it has always confused me. It has confused me because politics determines the quality, the very essence of our lives, the standard at which we're able to live, you know, the safety, the security, the peaceable enjoyment thereof, the well, our welfare. And you can't leave politics to politicians. You simply can't. Because there, is, there has never been, there isn't, and there's never been a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A perfect standard for what interest is across board. It varies from you know, sector to sector, from people to people. You need people who are supposed, who are to able, as a country, we need people who are able to help us define a best standard that brings the greater good to the greater number. To be able to do that, you need people who have a thorough understanding of the various sectors. How do we determine who these people are? Now, we find that the kind of politics we've been running in Nigeria is anybody but this person. So we find that people come together to kick one person out and it's everybody but this person. Now, like you mentioned earlier as well, there's such a dirty notion about politics that people don't want to get involved so as to saw their hands. And now we, you're advocating for people to be involved as well. And we're seeing now also people are saying that PVC is not enough. So how do we determine, you know, the quality of people? What first are the things to look out for? First and foremost, qualification. For before you're able to preach to me about being um, able to deliver, are you, are you even qualified? Our constitution sets such a low standard in that it says you only have to have a school certification to be able to come. But that's funny. You, to be able to get this job, you need more than that. To be able to get a job in a bank, you need more than that. There are bank adverts, there are job adverts that say minimum requirement, masters. Yet, at the apex of it all, at the very decision-making position of their lives, all you require is a school, is a YX certificate. So this educational qualification is first, very important? First, okay. first. Then you also need a track record. You need to be able to show me management skills. You need to be able to show me people skills. You need to be able to show me empathetical skills, emotional intelligence. You need to be able to show that you understand when it is, you went to assuage, you know, the needs and wills of a people, and when to be strong, when to be firm. You need to know, show that as a leader, you know when to back down and when to proceed. You know, so there's a lot of stuff. You need to be able to show me the ability to run an organization profitably. But does it have to be a political history? Because it, do, it, has, it doesn't have to be okay, political, great. not always. It doesn't always have to be a political history. But there has to be a background that shows an ability to run an organization optimally. So we need to see that you're credible based yes. on what you've done so far. Yes. And that is certainly one That is one where thing. the credibility comes. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's something the Nigerians do enough. I think, and this is to answer a, a more recent question, that um, a notion that you've um, thrown up. For far too long as a country, we, and I didn't understand that, we vote a person out. Sorry? Makes no sense to me. Because on the ballot box, it says, and I'll, excuse me, pardon me to use the names of real political parties, PDP or APC, ADP, PDP, 
Labour Party, and what have you. There's, a, there's no place that says, not this person. So you're actually voting for a person, not voting against a person. I don't know if you understand what I mean. So if you're saying that ah, I'm tired of PD PDP or I want them out of office, you're voting for an APC candidate. You need to understand what is this candidate offering? What are his promises? What, is, what are the policies he wants to, that, you know, that he wants to implement once he gets into office? Um, if you're voting an APC candidate out, ah, again, voting out, I don't understand. But if you're voting for someone, if you say, I'm tired of the status quo, I want to change it, you need to interrogate. So this PDP guy is coming to come and talk to me, and I'm considering voting for him. You need to be able to interrogate that person to say, okay, what are your plans? What are your projections? These are the things that you're saying that you're going to do. Where are you going to get the money from? How are you going to be able to account for that money? There has to be an understanding of what the person you're voting for is, or of what the person you're voting for is proposing. Mm what he's saying he's going to implement. That thing of I want to vote, I've never understood it. To be so honest. aside from that understanding that you have to have, what are the key things in terms of voters' education do citizens need to know when looking at manifestos and when going forth towards the 2019 elections? Um, voting for a candidate, you know, get your PVC and all that, is only maybe 50% of the journey, to be realistic, right? The can, at that point, the point of going to the ballot box and pressing your hand, you know, as the thing goes, um, you're voting for someone who's already been selected and presented to you. So you're only limiting your choice. You see what I mean? It's not grassroots. Now, it's not grassroots. Have you, have you ever att attended party primaries to see the process by which candidates are selected for you to vote? If you have... It's nothing short of depressing, really. It's, it's actually quite depressing. So if, if anybody asks me if we want to change our, our country, if we want better, we have to be able to influence the process of selecting candidates. We have to join political parties. We have to attend meetings of political parties. We have to present ourselves to be voted for at the political party level. We have to join the internal dynamics of political parties. That way, we can help influence the choices that we then pre um, present before the general public. So that, that way, it's not like, oh, I don't like this person, anybody but this person. That way, you're able you to say, options. you know what, I know what I want. We need to help ourselves know what we want. So it's not that I don't like um, Lagbaja to use the word that you borrowed earlier, the name that you borrowed earlier, and so I want anybody else, is that, see, I like Akuridi. How do I help Akuridi get to the, ballot, to the ballot paper so that other people, that's the process. Otherwise, as a country, most of us have restricted ourselves to only 50% 50, 50 of the journey. And I think in doing that, we do it ourselves a disservice. All right, we'll still come back to talk about that 50%, which is getting your PVC. But let's talk about women. Now, over the years, we've seen a decline in the representation of women in the political scene. In Nigeria now, we're starting to see that more young people are coming out for elections in 2019. Recently, I saw a 39-year-old woman. We're starting to see more people indicating interest due to the success of the Not Too Young to Run bill. However, we're seeing that our question is, do we see, is Nigeria ready for active or equal female participation in politics. Earlier today, we mentioned how Tunisia's first female mayor of the capital mm -hmm. emerged, a 54-year-old pharmacist. Are we at that level yet in Nigeria? And if not, how long will it take us to get there? Let me ask, answer your question in a roundabout sort of way. We need to bring ourselves to that level. I checked Nigeria's population demographics today, and women constitute about 50% of our population. If 49. Not 14, okay, well, okay. conflicting. One said 49.4, another one said 52%. So let's just meet at the median, 50% of our population. How do you want to run your country adequately, properly, if 50% of your population is excluded from the process of running the country? How do you go to a boxing match with one arm tied behind your back? How's that going to work? You know, how... Let's even use specific numbers. We're saying to ourselves that 
180 million people, 15 percent, 90 million people are automatically, by the system of politics that we run, excluded. And the exclusion is done from very simple things, very actually quite simple things. I'll give you an example of one of those simple things. A lot of the decision-making meetings they happen at night. Happen at night. Mm -hmm. In political parties, across board, automatically, many women who are married or who have children or who have otherwise um, family engagements are unable to attend. It seems like something so simple, but it's so profound. It's kind of like INEC offices only being open from 9 to 3 every day. Yeah. Yeah. It's so profound. And so we exclude. It's not, it's, it's something, I, I, I believe that we constantly shoot ourselves in the foot. And having had the privilege of being raised by a number of strong women and being um, surrounded by very strong women, it, I, I only constantly see Nigeria as, as, as doing itself another disservice when we exclude. Exclude. I've always thought, um, I've always been, you know, one way or the other, not very sure about whether we should establish a quota system or we should rigidly um, implement a quota system that reserves a minimum of 30% of political offices for women. But yeah. you see, 30% or 35% yeah. is... Limiting still. Still. That's three points. That's three out of 10. Those are still shocking. Numbers. You see, I don't, I don't necessarily like the word quotas because I do think quotas is limiting, like you just said. But when we look at targets, for example, targets is less limiting as a word. Now, Nigeria should definitely set certain targets in terms of gender representation in politics and other representations as well. If we look at the Canadian polity, for example, and we take the structure that Trudeau has put in, we can see that he's done that to ensure that every citizen is equally represented within the policy so that everyone can have a say, everyone can have a voice. What is it really going to take for Nigeria to meet these targets and say, you know what, we're not just representing X percent of our population here, we are representing all citizens as a democratic country? Well, I, I, to be honest, I, do, I don't know what it's going to take, to be very honest. We've got to do a lot of dismantling. We have to do a lot of unlearning of political systems, of educational systems, of cultural systems, of religious systems. We've got to do a lot of dismantling, and we've got to erect better structures in their place. Um, in terms of culture, it's one of the difficult things, because how do we take the bad out and leave the good? How do we ensure that, you know, while we adapt to new age trends and uh, movements, we still remain essentially Nigerian? You know, it's, it's, it's been a... It's been one of the things that I think has challenged that dynamism. Another thing I think is, is our laws. Our laws are stuck, are rigid. And it doesn't just apply to the um, involvement of women in politics. It applies to quite a number of things. Like, for instance, you can't confer Nigerian citizenship on a foreigner by reason of marriage. I can if you applied for a passport for a child, you'd have to bring a letter from your husband, husband or spouse, or the father of the child. I can do that without a bother. On occasion, if you get to the airport and you want to travel from this country without a child, um, with a child, sorry, customs will ask you to bring notification or permission from the father of the child. Nobody will ask me to do that. So. There is a limitation on women in this country that goes beyond politics. And we have to take those out. I think it was you, Olive, who gave the number that as many as 60% of out-of-school children are girls. That is 6 out of 10. If we flip the number and we discuss the target, to use a better word, yeah. um, or the target of 35% um, of women for every political office. You see that the number of disadvantaged people that we're already braving is twice the number of people that we're seeking to empower.
you know. So it's, if you look at the numbers, you realize that we have a lot of dismantling to do. And it comes from, 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 from some of the things that we teach our children when they're young. A boy comes second in class to a girl and you ask, how can you lose to a girl? A boy and a girl are engaged in, you know, because children engage in those kind of fights. And a girl be, the girl beats him. How can a girl beat you? Oh, my God. Why are you crying? Why are you crying like a girl? And so from age whatever, we're institutionalizing the classification of women as second-class citizens. From age small. You know? Think about it. You know, it's... What are the kind of toys that you buy, that we see buy for two children? You buy the dolls for the girls and you buy the balls, footballs for the boys. Footballs, cars, guns. What do you buy for the girls? Dolls. And teddies. Kitchen, kitchens. Yeah. Miniature kitchens. And we're reinforcing that. You know, the role of the man is the role of a risk taker. You know, that, you know, life on the fast lane. Take risks. Go out. Try and get it done. But the role of a woman is at home, in the kitchen. So we have a lot of unlearning to do. There's one thing that constantly challenges me. Is it, is it, is it nature or nurture when we say women mature quicker than boys, that girls mature faster than boys? Is it nature or nurture? I think it's more of nurture than nature. Yes, mm -hmm. that's because we teach women values from a young age that we don't teach to boys. Yeah. Then when they learn that, those values, they come to the workplace and they're excluded. They come to the place of politics, they're excluded. They come to the place of society, they're excluded. They come to the place of religion, they're excluded. And it's not just in Nigeria. We have this happening all around the world, in yes. different parts of the world. Yes. I mean, according to a report by the World Economic Forum, the Gender Gap Report, it was said that it would take 200 years for us to be able to breach the gap between men and women. But before we let you go, let's talk about voting cards, the 50% that you talked about, mm -hmm. the PVCs. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for people to get their PVCs? Because there's still people who think that there's no point in getting a PVC when the result will be manipulated at the end of the day. So why, why is it important to at least get a PVC? Results cannot be manipulated if you do the simple processes. Turn up to vote. Wait peacefully after the, you have voted. At the conclusion of voting, wait when the votes are counted, hear the results. It makes it more difficult. The truth is that for every person who doesn't, who has the opportunity to vote and who doesn't, you give that much headroom to the people who seek to manipulate our electoral processes to indeed manipulate those processes. Once you've turned up and you voted and your vote has been counted and has been announced, manipulating the result there becomes a little bit more difficult. The real manipulation is done after people, you know, starts after people leave. And then there are unused ballot papers, and then people are permitted to thumbprint, and so on and so forth. You know? Now, because you would not wait for your results to be counted and then declared, people are able to fudge the figures. But to be able to be a part of the process at all, of the voting process, you have to have a PVC. Absolutely. Now, why do you need to have, why do you need to be a part of the voting process? Because the decisions that are made affect all of us, whether you vote or you don't. I don't know, it doesn't matter whether people voted Buhari or not, right? If it makes a policy, it affects all of us. It doesn't matter whether you voted for Ambody or not. If Ambody comes and says, cars cannot pass on Etimiang Street after six o'clock, it affects all of us. So we need to be able to help put the people that would do the greater good to the greater number of people in office. Absolutely, absolutely. And unless and until we're able to achieve that, we'll be in the permanently stuck in this cycle where government after government, where people after people, where policy after policy, where administration after administration is perceived as worse than the immediate past one, and we come to that place where we say, anybody but the incumbent. It's not a good place to be. Absolutely. Now, I do have a question for you, because I think this is something that's very important for us to try and dissect. Now, 
in Nigeria's history, if we look at Nigeria's history, it's not that we've never had women involved in any sort of political or civic engagement sort of scene. We've heard of women like Queen Amina of Zaria, who used to lead communities back in the day. We know about the Aba Women's Riots that was also called the Women's War of 1929. We know about women like Margaret Ekwa. We know about women like Fumilayo Ransom Kusi. These are women who have paved a certain path. Is the problem that women of the 21st century or women who have the position to uphold political power in the 21st century have failed at doing that based on the fact that we do have these women that have actually opened doors for us in the past. But you need to contextualize the achievements of these women about whom you speak. How many Queen Aminas did we have in her, in her day? She stood up because she was the Queen Amina. Yeah. You know, we've had the Abba women's, we had the Abba women's riots. But why was that effective? Why do we remember that? We remember it because it was a coalition of women. If you remember what Honorable Kazauri um, Gudaje in the House of Reps said a few weeks ago, it went viral on video, so I can quote it because mm. he said it in public. Yeah. We are afraid we shouldn't allow these women gather. If they do, they will take power from us. It wasn't me who said it. He said it. And he's a House of Reps member. So where's the real thing? The, the, the problem is that in the 21st century, we've become too enamored. No, enamored is the wrong, wrong word. Distracted, the better word, too misdirected by the needs and the demands of our everyday life that we forget the power of community. And so far too many women have, and I, and I say this most respectfully without the intention to offend anybody. Yeah. It's just the, to my mind, a contextual reality where there's so many people who are trying to get a good roof over their heads, are trying to get schools for their kids, are trying to contribute to the maintenance of the family. And, and it's not just a, I'm only saying this now because we're talking about women. It's my general opinion about both sexes, mm. that we forget the power of organization to get the people we want into office, to make them accountable for the promises they made before they got into office, to make them accountable for the um, um, proceeds, and, if you will, of, the, yeah, the commonwealth, better word, you know, while you're in office. I believe that in the 21st century, while we have so much more of life, you know, we have tools that enable us to live more, we're not living as well as we should. I, um, yes, even now, we can quickly point out women who achieve those heights, the same sort of heights that Queen Amina achieved, or the about women's riots achieved, or whatever other ones, other examples, um, the ransom, Mrs. Ram, ransom could see. Mm -hmm. We could point out women who stand out and who reach the pinnacle of I think the highest earning banker in Africa at the moment is a woman. I think so. But how many? At what rate? What's the frequency? That's where the perpetual challenge has been. And from way back, there's always been a constant tuning of the organs of society, the instruments of society, to exclude women. So even while Queen Amina was, was, was queen, there were people who resisted her rule yeah. on account of the fact that she was female. And even after that, we've had several other women, you know, who have come out in the political scene to try and rise to the very apex of power here. We know the, the likes of the Sarah Jibrils who contested presidency about four times. I shall um, special advise her to President Gulaki Bele Jonathan. Away from her, let's look at the most recent election. We had remission here. And mm -hmm. I remember having some conversations with some women and they outrightly said they weren't going to vote for her. Now, I totally like what you said about what you, what you said when you quoted the House of Rep member stating that when women come together, they, there's so much strength in unity, which is what we're trying to preach today. As we proceed for 2019 elections, we need to look within ourselves. When we see a woman that is qualified, stand behind her, support her, and do not, we shouldn't by ourselves be the ones to segregate our fellow mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. Final question before we let you go. Okay. There's so much we need to learn about politics. What's your take on including political lectures in our secondary school curriculums and how early should we start? The biggest disservice 
I think that we have done to ourselves as a nation is that we, one, we took history out yeah. of our school curriculum. Our people don't know our history. So you go to schools and they both and they tell you that they run a British style curriculum and they can tell you all about American Independence Day, where the Statue of Liberty emanated from, the Battle of Waterloo, and so on and so forth. But not many of our children these days will be able to speak as eloquently as you did, or as contextually as you did, regarding Queen Amina or the Abba Women's Riot. Can I actually even add to that? Sorry, just very quickly, because that's a very good point. When I was in secondary and primary school in Ibadan, the 4th of July would come, being today, and we went by the American curriculum. And as soon as it was the 4th of July, ah, it's a mufti day for everyone, it's a party in the school because we're celebrating something of American history. When it came to anything to do with Nigerian history, even just Independence Day, it was just, okay, today is Nigerian Independence Day, bam, bam, go on and go to class, you know? It makes no sense. So we don't even understand and appreciate where we're coming from in the first place. So how do we hide, run away from it? How do we ensure that the mistakes that led to the Civil War we don't even speak about the civil war. Yeah, which is why a lot of people are clamoring for wars and division in Nigeria because they do not have first-hand or second-hand knowledge of, of what how happened. How did we come Carry from the there to here? We need to teach in quite a lot of schools, you know, civic education is restricted to manners, you know, how to behave. And this is important, don't get me wrong, it's very important. But there is a lack of understanding. Your first real engagement with politics or with, you know, social, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Social Governance, responsibility. Social responsibility comes in SS1, government. Forget all the social studies that we're teaching. Social yeah. studies just teaches you about the family yeah. unit and yeah. the life. Yeah. <laughs> it, it comes in SS1. In SS1, you're already potentially 14 years old, 15 years old. Late, a little bit late in my opinion. I believe that we need to start, we need to get to a place where from primary school age, our boys and our girls have been able to identify heroes past, named German heroes, to whom they can relate. Absolutely. Even to during whom they can, activities. They can hold in high esteem and seek to emulate them, you know, style themselves after. I like that you mentioned that because I remember Aya would say it, she always shared the story of how when she was little, her mom wrote a list of influential women around the world, sent the list to her and to her sister and said, look at this woman, look at their achievements, decide which woman you want to model your life after. So I think we need to get to a level where we have our heroes past and present, we idolize them, we teach our young ones what these people have achieved mm -hmm. so that they can be inspired, they have something to look up to, someone mm -hmm. actually to look up to. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, really, it's really, we have a long way to go, but with baby steps like this, coming out to talk about this and coming out to create awareness, we're hoping that the kind of um, political awareness that we want in Nigeria will be achieved and the kind of involvement that we want for women in 2019 will be achieved. Thank you very much for joining us. It's an absolute Thank you delight so much. to be on a program that is often preserved for women. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, today, actually, preserved for women. Oh, but thank God. you very much for actively and um, intentionally, holistically speaking about women and their involvement in politics Thank as well. you. Very refreshing. To enjoy more of this, our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page.